Can you hear me? Yes. Good. All righty. All right, so the, uh, the purpose of these lectures is to prove that not all the dinosaurs in Colorado are dead. So I'm going to be talking about Chern-Simons theory at a very elementary level. And um, notes are available. I don't know how to put it to the, on the wiki, but you can go to my home page. Now, if you look at the notes, you'll see that there's just a little bit more than we can cover in 300 minutes of lecturing. So I'm going to spend the first 15 or 20 minutes with a grand overview. And um, then we're going to go back and start very simple with a problem in quantum mechanics. All right, so I'm not a historian of science. Um, so I'll say, make a few brief historian, uh, historical remarks. So Chern-Simons theory is a kind of quantum field theory, which is based on what's called the Chern-Simons form. And it's both highly non-trivial and yet extremely computable. And it's an example of a topological field theory, which means that some of the difficulties of quantum field theory, having to do with local degrees of freedom, um, renormalization questions, renormalization group questions, these get put aside so that you can actually focus on other aspects of field theory, namely how topology and field theory interact. And um, mathematically, the Chern-Simons form, so there's something called the Chern-Simons form, we'll see it later. Um, it's, it's related to a mathematical topic called transgression. Uh, which goes back to uh, work of Chern in uh, mid-40s. And then Chern and Simons took that up again around 1974 to discuss some mathematical questions of immersions of three-dimensional spaces into other spaces. And then it started to enter the consciousness of physicists in the late 70s, early 90s. I don't know exactly when, but there's something called the anomaly descent formalism. And Chern-Simons forms play an important role there. And that's the early 80s. As far as I know, the first people to consider using a Chern-Simons term as a, as a term in an action is work of Desert, Jakeef, and, and Templeton. In 1982, I believe. Then, in 1988, uh, Witten wrote a fundamental paper called Quantum Field Theory and the Jones Polynomial. And in this paper, he answered a question that uh, was, was posed by Michael Atiyah. Uh, the question was, uh, well, Vaughan Jones was writing some very interesting invariants of knots, not polynomials. And, uh, Atiyah was asking, well, is there a physical interpretation of this? And uh, Witten found an answer, and it 
It had, has had enormous consequences. It started a boom which is still reverberating. Now, in essence, Witten's story from that paper is very simple. So I'm going to sketch it. And I'm going to go very fast, and I'm not going to prove things. So hold your questions. We're going to go back and start really simple with quantum mechanics and so on. But I just want to give uh, an overview of what Witten was saying in that paper. So let uh, G be a Lie group. And so we're going to consider a, a three-dimensional gauge theory. with gauge group G. So locally, what is a gauge field? Locally, um, well, locally you have some patch inside your three manifold. And so the gauge field will be written as a one form on that patch with values in the Lie algebra of G. So that's my approximation to a Gothic G. So Lee of G is this equals backslash math frac G. Okay. So, um, so then we can, if you choose a basis for the Lee algebra and local coordinates, you could write your gauge field that way. OK. Now, our convention will be that the gauge transformations act so that the covariant, so we have a right action. And so then you can form the field strength, F, which is dA plus A squared, which is sitting inside omega 2 of U with values in the Lie algebra. All right, so now what you do is you give yourself a conjugation invariant quadratic polynomial. P. So for example, uh, if we think of G as a matrix Lie algebra, a Lie algebra of certain kinds of matrices, then P of x might be trace of x squared in some representation. All right, so then you're invited to consider P of f. f is in f is valued in the Lie algebra, so you could apply p of f. And because this is quadratic, this is some kind of four form. Now, this is a total derivative, so it might help for some people if we write trace of f squared. This is d of trace of a dA plus 2 thirds a cubed. And in general, P is equal to D of what I'll call turn Simon sub P of F of A. All right, so now we imagine we want to do a quantum field theory, a three-dimensional quantum field theory. So now we imagine that there's some measure DA on curly A, which is the space of all gauge fields on M3. And moreover, Moreover, we imagine that this measure, dA, can be pushed down 
to what's called A mod G. This is the space of all gauge in equivalent. field configurations. All right, so um, Latin G is the gauge group. Curly G is the group of gauge transformations. OK, so don't confuse the gauge group which is typically a finite dimensional compact Lie group, with the group of all gauge transformations, which is an infinite dimensional Banach group. So um, this is, for example, if my principal bundle is trivial, just the space of maps from M3 into G. OK. And now what we're supposed to do is consider a path integral over all of A mod G of dA of E to the I, the integral of turn Simon sub P of A over M3. Now we should be keeping track of what kind of structures we need to put on our space time for these theories to make sense. And at exactly at this point, we see that we need to have an orientation. So the chern simons theory requires that you have an oriented three-manifold. All right. Now, this P here must be suitably quantized. And why is that? Because, OK, we're imagining we have some measure here. That means that this thing that we're integrating over A mod G had better be a well-defined function. On A mod G. In other words, e to the i integral over p of turn Simon, whoops, sorry, m over m3 of turn Simon sub p of a should be gauge invariant. Well, is it? All I told you is that p is a quadratic polynomial on the Lie algebra. I didn't, let me stress something here. When I write trace, I don't literally mean trace. I mean trace with some normalization. It's a crucial point. OK, I, I misspoke. I said trace in some representation. What I really want is there's some normalization factor here. And for example, if, if, Lie, if the Lie algebra is a simple Lie algebra, then there's a theorem that says that all invariant polynomials, quadratic polynomials, are equal to the trace and your favorite irreducible representation up to an overall normalization. OK, but I didn't say that the Lie algebra was simple. So we could, so this trace is a very you know, abstract thing. All right, so is this gauge invariant? Well. Let's make a gauge transformation. And then you can show, I'm not showing it now, you can show that the churn simons form changes this way. So even when M3 has no boundary. And so if all our field configurations are nice and smooth, no boundary, we can drop this term. Even then, we have this term to contend with. And it can certainly happen if the, if the group G has any 
non-trivial topology then um, and along with M3 M3 should also have some non-trivial topology then it can happen that the integral over M3 of turn Simon sub P of G inverse DG is not zero. So does everybody know what I mean when I write A upper G? I think I wrote it over there. Nobody complained. I think it was, it should have been understood. Let me make it explicit that G is something like a map from M3 into my gauge group. Non-trivial homotopy groups or homology groups or something like that. Uh, uh, the question was, what do I mean by non-trivial topology? And the answer is uh, not contractible. That's probably the best answer. And you measure that non-contractibility by either homotopy groups or homology groups or cohomology groups. All right. So. This looks bad. This looks like our action is not gauge invariant, but it's OK if e to the i integral over m3 of churn Simon sub p of g inverse dg is equal to 1 for all m3 and g from m3 to g. So I'm going to call that the. Um, either the multi-valued action principle or the exponentiated action principle. So actions can fail to be gauge invariant and still be good for physics because the only thing we need in our path integral is the exponentiated action. So this will happen for quantized values of p. All right. So that's just saying that for some, some traces, this, uh, this quantum action principle makes sense. Now you want to look at observables. I have to master the boards here. Oh, let's see. Oh, that one doesn't come down. OK. The second one's still already there. It is indeed. Thank you. Um, question? Uh, yeah. Are you, are you implying that um, the G bundle is trivial here? I am. Okay. I think I said that. Um, because, OK, uh, let's see. Here I am. Great. Could you repeat the question? Thank you. Um, the question was, am I assuming that the G bundle is trivial? Not really, but to help you, when I write about the, um, the group of gauge transformations, it's easier for people to think. And what I do in practice is I think about a map from M3 to G. The real story is that um, we have our group G. We have our three-manifold. Don't know where I introduced the three manifold. We have a three manifold, and what we have is a principal G bundle over the three manifold. That means the fibers of this map pi, the inverse images of the map pi at every point on M3 is a is a copy of G. It's a, it's a copy of the group without a choice of identity. And um, in that case, this would not be quite correct. The correct thing to say would be that we would have the automorphisms of the principal bundle. And if you know what principal bundles are, you probably know what automorphisms of principal bundles are. So that's some infinite dimensional group. And if P is what's called trivializable, in other words, if P is equivalent to a product M3 times G, then ought G, this is in the trivializable case, becomes what I wrote down here. Map M3 to G. This is isomorphic if P is trivializable. Okay. 
All right. So now, um, now I, an, an interesting class. of observables is obtained by what are called line defects. They are commonly called line operators, even though they're not operators. Um, and to define it, you take an oriented loop. gamma inside M3. So here's your picture, M3, some loop, gamma, oriented. And you take a representation, let's say a finite dimensional representation of our gauge group, call it capital R. And then we can write the Wilson line defect, R gamma, is the trace over R of the path ordered exponential along gamma of A. Now I'm assuming you know what a path ordered exponential is. If you don't, look at appendix H of the notes. So um, this is gauge invariant. And it's think of this as a function of A. So now we can enhance this path integral a little bit by imagining that they're a bunch of loops. They might be linked. They might be knotted. And so now we integrate over A mod G this function e to the i integral over M3 turn Simon sub p of A. All right, so so now you might note that I didn't use a metric to define the action. So you might hope, naively, that this theory is going to be a topological field theory. The correlation functions are going to be independent of distance independent of metric, and they're just going to define topological invariance of M3 and the loops embedded in M3. So you could have, you could imagine that these loops are linked, or maybe they uh, form knots, like that. Uh, I always draw an unknot. There we go. There we go. Still drew in one knot. Ah, shoot. <laughs> no, I had to write the first. I had, ah, shoot. <laughs> All right, it's actually very hard to draw an unknot. I uh, draw something which is a knot and not an unknot. Uh, at least for some people. Uh, so, so this should be a topological invariant of M3 and these loops and links and knots inside M3. And uh, that's almost true. There is a topological anomaly. Uh, the Wilson lines actually carry some more data because of ultraviolet divergences. So I'm telling you a little bit some lies here. Um, and we'll see that in the abelian case later on. Now, if we take G equals SU2 and we let uh, Varstras P of X be minus k over 8 pi squared trace in the two-dimensional representation of x squared. And k is an integer. It's one of the most basic cases. Then you can take the expectation value in the two-dimensional representation of a knot. In case m3 is s3. And now, interestingly, this becomes a polynomial in Q, which is e to the 2 pi i over k plus 2. And remarkably, this is the Jones polynomial.
That was the answer to Atiyah's question. So um, that was a major breakthrough. And it, it was an important ingredient in Witten's Fields Medal in 1990. And clearly, it's very important if you're interested in the topology of three manifolds. Hmm? No, no. Uh, no. Gamma is a, a knot, OK? Like, like the trefoil or some more complicated knot in S3, OK? What was the question? Uh, where? Yeah. OK, so the question is, is this independent of gamma? The answer is most emphatically no. Um, the whole point is that the Jones polynomial is a polynomial in Q that depends on the knot gamma. That was the idea. The idea was that for every knot, you would write down a polynomial in Q, and then if you deform the knot smoothly, and recompute, it's the same polynomial. And maybe if you're lucky and you have two different knots and you want to know if they're different or not, you calculate their Jones polynomials. If the Jones polynomial is different, then you know for sure they can't be deformed to each other. If they turn out to be the same, you don't know. Further investigation is necessary. OK. The question is, what's that symbol? And uh, there are a lot of symbols on the board, so it's hard to parse. But I'm guessing it's this one you're talking about. Yeah. <clears throat> it's the same as that symbol. And um, it's, it's a 2, so the numeral 2, with an underline to indicate that I'm talking about the representation. So I'm, giving you the I'm specifying a representation of SU2 by its dimension with the understanding that it's an irreducible representation, because SU2 has two different two-dimensional representations, if you think about it. Um, OK, so, so clearly this was, uh, this was great for three-manifold topology. This was completely unforeseen. But um, Chern-Simon's theory has turned out to have a a wide variety of other applications. So I thought I would list those before we get down to real business here. So, OK, so why do we care? I mean, if you're not a three-manifold topologist, you might not care about this. But you should care about Chern-Simons theory. So it gives you a, as I said before, a solvable but non-trivial example of a field theory, because of there's a vast reduction of the degrees of freedom. It's a, actually an example of what's called a topological field theory. You can write down axioms for what a topological field theory is, but it's actually hard to find interesting, non-trivial examples of those axioms. And so this, again, does that. Then it has a holographic, in quotes, relation to 2D, 2D conformal field theory. particularly something called rational conformal field theory. Can I ask you a question? Hmm? Related to this, this connection. Hmm? So the uh, argument of the Jones polynomial Q, is the K over 2, that 2 is the dual coxeter number of SU2? That is correct. So the question was, um, what about this 2? Everybody's asking about my 2s. Uh, <laughs> You're not asking about this too, I assume. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, OK. So yes, indeed, this 2 here. So um, the, the question is, is that 2 
a, uh, the dual Coxeter number. And um, the answer is yes in the following sense. If we generalized uh, to a compact, simple Lie group, then it has associated to it something called the dual Coxeter number. So for example, for SUN, the dual Coxeter number is N. And uh, for E8, it's 30. And I won't try and list them all. So what happens is Q, you again, if you, if you, if you write uh, the Wilson line expectation value for these other cases with basically any representation, you'll get a polynomial in e to the 2 pi over k plus h, where I, you don't know what k is yet because I haven't told you um, how to normalize this p of x. Well, the normalization is in the notes. I'll probably get it wrong by a factor of 2 if I try and do it right now, but I'll, I'll give it a try. So I think it's p of x is something like 1 over 16 pi squared, dual Coxeter number, times uh, the trace and the adjoint representation of x squared. And then if we put a k there, then might have a factor of 2 here wrong. It's, it's correct in the notes. Then the answer will be a, dual, a polynomial in this q. So yes, that 2 is the dual Coxeter number. But, but 2 isn't the actual. No, but. Um, but you see, <laughs> but look, it's it's not eight pi squared either, right? Um, yeah. So, so for SU two, uh, you see, I said before that if you have a simple Lie algebra, then all the add invariant traces are related by a factor, and so there's something you you know. So any representation x squared will be equal to some C two of R times the trace in the adjoint of x squared. So for example, for the uh, SU2, uh, the 2 of x squared, I think, is something like um, uh, 1 fourth of the trace in the adjoint of x squared. Okay. All right, so um, where was I? Uh, yeah, so I was, I was talking about um, various applications. So yes, yeah, so Holographic, holographic relation to 2D rational conformal field theory. So let me say a little bit about what I have in mind here. So imagine that we have M3, which is of the form sigma 2 times R. Now, here's our sigma 2, some uh, compact surface. And then we can imagine R is time. And in this situation, physics tells us there should be some Hilbert space. And much of these lectures are simply going to be trying to get at this Hilbert space, even for the simplest case of U1 level k. Now, this Hilbert space turns out to be, so this is just the space of quantum states. So for reasons you'll appreciate later, this is finite dimensional. And it turns out to be related to what is called the uh, vector space of conformal blocks. Of a corresponding two D CFT. So if we imagine a on this two-dimensional surface, we could put a two-dimensional uh, um, conformal field theory. What conformal field theory depends on what gauge group we chose and uh, what polynomial p we chose. One at, at the level that I've spoken right now, uh, one can talk, oh, sorry, the question was, can you take G to be a non-compact Lie group? And for what I've said so far, indeed, uh, I could take G to be a non-compact Lie group, and non-compact Lie groups are interesting and important. The theory is best understood in the case of compact Lie groups. Okay, uh, and 
certainly the examples we're going to be looking at are Cupac Lie groups. Now, that is actually relevant to what I'm saying right here because um, this correspondence is by far best understood in the case of a compact Lie group. So the other thing you can do is you could consider a three-manifold of the following form. You take something like a disk and again multiply by R and maybe you put a Wilson line in here down the center of this, uh, this solid cylinder. And now there's a whole issue of what boundary conditions we put. But with suitable boundary conditions, the gauge modes on the boundary become propagating fields. of a conformal field theory. This time, the conformal field theory is on the boundary of that solid cylinder. In other words, on the cylinder. I'll call these edge modes. So there was this three-dimensional point of view on two-dimensional uh, conformal field theory, which was extremely effective. Um, for understanding th certain things. For example, uh, the 3D viewpoint gave a simple proof of what's known of what's known as the Fralinda formula. Now, the, what is the Ferlinda formula? Well, the Ferlinda formula is a relationship between operator product expansion coefficients on the one hand and the, uh, the response of correlators to non-trivial diffeomorphisms. Of your surface. All right. Going down my list of applications, the next one is indeed about non-compact groups. Hmm, question? What? Uh, yeah, so in this situation, when you do have a silver space, mm -hmm. it becomes no longer the terminology of the first line. Um, depends how you orient them. So, the case in which they really are, is there colored chalk? No, I don't see any. Uh, the, uh, sorry, the, the, the question is an excellent question. So um, I, was, I, was, um, I was hinting before that line defects versus line operators is an abusive terminology because Back here, when I'm inserting these, what's it operating on? It's, I would call it a defect operator. You stick it into the path integral, and so on. So, um, However, here we have a Hilbert space of states. And so we really can talk about linear operators on that vector space. And you bet. So if we take, if we take the, uh, the gamma, probably not a good idea to make it self-intersect. If we, if we take the gamma um, to be some loop inside the surface, then W of R of gamma does indeed become an operator acting on the Hilbert space. That's one of our four points of view for quantizing the, um, uh, the U1 level K theory. We're going to take a purely operator algebra point of view and write down the algebra of these Wilson line operators. All right, um, another application. So, Chern Simons for certain non compact groups uh, might be related to 3D quantum gravity. a subject which is still, I would say, murky. And um, in this case, Brown and Hanau 
identify the edge modes of the graviton with Vera Cero symmetry. And that was one of the first manifestations of the ADS-CFT correspondence. All right, another application. You notice that the action, I don't know, is the action still on the board? Uh, well, let me write it. So the action, which is looking something like k over 8 pi squared, trace of a dA plus 2 thirds a cubed, well, there's only one derivative. Okay. So if you're thinking about a long distance effective field theory expansion of some three dimensional theory, then you would expect that to be the dominant term in the infrared, right? Because you're doing a derivative expansion when you go to the infrared. So um, this indeed uh, turns up in effective actions for the fractional quantum Hall effect. Uh, in which case it uses an emergent gauge field. Not the Maxwell gauge field. That's not the, the gauge field you integrate over. And uh, then the edge modes become real physical modes that are measured in the lab. And the topologically non-trivial properties of these Wilson line operators, well, if you think about the Wilson line operators as sort of world lines of particles in two plus one dimensions, the topologically, the fact that it's sensitive to things like braiding implies uh, non-trivial statistics. So we have things like anions and nonabelions, and this is potentially of interest in quantum information theory and quantum computing. So that's four. Five is dynamics of gauge theories. And I, so you can have interesting domain walls in four dimensional gauge theories with Chern Simons theories on the, as the theories on the domain wall. And I suspect uh, Professor Zeidberg is going to talk about that. So I'm not going to say more. Supergravity. Well, Chern Simons terms often appear in supergravity actions in various dimensions. So I, I have written the Chern Simons invariant, the Chern Simons action as if it's a, a three dimensional phenomenon, but indeed it uh, has natural generalizations in all odd dimensions. I noticed, yeah. Thank you. Um, next is um, in topological string theory. Well, in topological string theory, you, you simplify string theory quite a bit. Uh, but still, you know, in string theory, there's always, there, there are always two quantum field theories involved. There's the theory on the world sheet of the string and then there's the, the space-time field theory that you're trying to describe. The field theory that describes what the particles of string, what the strings are doing when they interact in that target space-time. So in this case, the target space-time theory are often Chern-Simons. And finally, last but not least, 
fundamental formulation of string theory. So this is, uh, to my mind, an extremely important problem. It's also extremely unfashionable and very much on hold. But nevertheless, it's important. We don't have a fundamental formulation of string theory the way we do, say, for Yang-Mills theory. And that's been a problem for quite some time. There are many approaches to this. One of the, one of the best approaches was something called string field theory. It has its problems. But um, the formulations of string field theory often involve turn simons type theories. All right. So now it would be appropriate to, uh, to list the outline of the topics we're going to cover in detail. But because I took so much time, I'm going to assign homework. So your homework is read the table of contents of my notes. <laughs> All right. So that will suffice to give you an overview of the topics in principle we would like to cover. We're actually only going to get through sections 2.1 and 2.2. Um, so, I hope. <laughs> so, um, so let's, uh, let's, let's take a step back. This was the grand overview. It took a lot longer than I hoped. Uh, so I'm going to step back and I'm going to talk about a problem in quantum mechanics because you can make some very nice conceptual points about the importance of topology in physics in a very simple system. So we're going to have, we're going to have a solenoid and a ring. Okay, so this is a solenoid and it has magnetic field B in it. And we have a ring, radius R, Particle mass m, charge e. So the particle's charged, confined to the ring. And I, you know, you're probably going to see this in Professor Seiberg's lectures again. So um, this is a, a very beautiful, very simple system because you can make, as I said, some very nice points, but everything is completely computable. All right. So what's the degree of freedom of the particle? Well. It's some angle, let's call it phi. So we have phi of t, the position of the particle. And phi is only defined modulo 2 pi. It's the angle as you go around the ring. So actually, it's better to think of h of t, which is e to the i phi of t, because that's really single value. And what h is, is h is a map from time into a target space, which happens to be u1. So we're really doing 0 plus 1 dimensional field theory. OK. So what's the action for this? So the action is half mr squared phi dot squared plus the um, electromagnetic coupling, which we'll talk about in a moment. So I could write that as 1 half. I could also write that as one, minus 1 half mr squared h inverse h dot squared plus the electromagnetic coupling. So this is the kind of action you see in a nonlinear sigma model. We have a map from a space time, which is just time, to a group. Now let me write the electromagnetic coupling. Uh, now, if you are following carefully what I said in the grand overview, I was taking my, I was taking my gauge fields to be Lie algebra valued. And what's the Lie algebra of, of U1? Hmm? Three I times the reals. 
What's the Lie algebra of un? I heard somebody say it. Perfect. I was. I'm glad. I glad I didn't get Hermitian matrices. Hermitian. Okay. Let me not launch into that. Anti-Hermitian matrices. They form a, Lie, a real Lie algebra. Okay. So when I was writing before, d plus a g equals g inverse d plus a g. Well, think about what it means for u1, right? So for u1, we would be shifting a goes to a plus i d epsilon if g was e to the i epsilon of x. So a would have to be i times a real number. Because you see, this is in u1, so epsilon is real. OK, um, however, last time I was in the lab, which was a long time ago, um, we measured electric fields in volts per meter, not the square root of minus 1 volts per meter. So my convention is, that gonna, is gonna be that when I talk about u1, and, and if I get there, torus groups, I'm going to take the gauge fields to be real. Okay. When I'm talking about the general theory like that, it's really best to use your gauge, have your gauge fields valued in uh, your compact Lie algebra. But for the purposes of what I'm going to do now, my gauge field is going to be real. All right. So what is the gauge field outside this? It's non-trivial. Somebody asked me earlier, what do I mean by topologically non-trivial? Well. My space, my, my particle is confined to a circle, OK? So the target space is topologically non-trivial. I'm going to be talking about, um, well, actually, at this point, that's all we've got. Um, well, no, sorry. We're going to be talking now, it's charged particle. So we're going to be talking about electromagnetism. And in electromagnetism, I'm going to take the gauge group to be U1. And again, U1 is topologically non-trivial. It's not contractible to a point. Pi 1 of U1 is the integers. All right. So anyway, what's the gauge field in this situation? Well, it's just B over 2 pi d phi. And what's the coupling to, of a charged particle to a, an electromagnetic field? Well, in the action, you insert IE, the integral along the world line of the particle, a mu of x of t, dx mu by dt, dt. All right. So continuing from up there, our action is a half i. i is the moment of inertia, uh, phi dot squared, plus the integral of e phi star of A, which is 1 half I phi dot squared plus EB over 2 pi phi dot dt. Now this is an example of what's called a theta term. Okay, Theta terms are what um, are always related to interesting aspects in topology and field theory. And indeed, uh, to see what reason why it should be called that, uh, consider one plus one dimensional um, uh, electromagnetism. So let's put it on a cylinder. Here's sigma. Here's time. And now the only gauge invariant degree of freedom here is the holonomy of my gauge field around the circle. Now this is a function of time, so let's call this h of t, and that's our e to the i phi of t. And so if we take the, uh, the action, 1 over e squared f star f, um, the integral of theta over 2 pi times f, then it will reduce to this, 
with theta over pi equals 2b. Uh, All right. This is also very similar to in 4D. Let me just record it. In 4D, we can also add a theta term. And now we have theta over 8 pi squared, 2 pi squared. Now, the common characteristic of all these theta terms is that they are total derivatives and do not affect the equations of motion. Nevertheless, they matter in quantum mechanics, and I will demonstrate that right now. So let's just demonstrate that by solving for the spectrum of the Hamiltonian and then discussing a little bit about the, the symmetries of the theory. So let's quantize this. So we introduce the angular momentum conjugate to phi dot. And now you see that's i phi dot plus eb over 2 pi. So this comes from that linear term, the total derivative that didn't change the equations of motion. Okay. Now, in quantum mechanics, this is going to be replaced by minus i h bar d by d phi. And so the Hamiltonian, you do the Legendre transformation, it's 1 over 2i l minus eb over 2 pi squared, where we can write that as h bar squared over 2i minus i d by d phi minus curly b squared, where curly b is eb over 2 pi h bar. So really what we get is we get a family of Hamiltonians parameterized by a real number curly b. And we can diagonalize this family of Hamiltonians. Let's diagonalize it. So the eigenfunctions are just psi sub m of phi. 1 over the square root of 2 pi, e to the i m phi, where this has to be an integer. That's quantum mechanics. That's the, uh, the quantization of the waves. All right, and so the energy is h bar squared over 2 i times m minus curly b squared. So what's the spectrum? Now the spectrum, as a function of m, is a parabola and it's symmetric around b. If m were not quantized, b would not matter. The spectrum of, if m were not quantized, the spectrum of the Hamiltonian would just be the real numbers from 0 to infinity. But m is quantized. And so the spectrum, so B really affects the spectrum. We only get these points. And it might be, we might have symmetry or not, as we will soon discuss. So it's putting that, putting this form of the Hamiltonian together with the quantization of M, which means that B matters. It affects the spectrum of the Hamiltonian. Now, indeed, it's a symmetric around B. 
So we have a symmetry under m goes to 2b minus m. But again, m is quantized to be an integer, so it only exists if 2b, which is theta over pi, is an integer. Now, the distinction between 2b being an even and an odd integer is also quite important. If 2b is odd, the ground state is doubly degenerate. And if it's even, singly degenerate. In other words, unique. Let's also note that the spectrum is periodic in B. So you, there exists a unitary operator on L2 of S1 so that U H sub B, U inverse, is H sub B plus 1. It's a little homework problem. Why don't you construct that unitary operator? It's very easy. All right, so B matters. Now let's see another way that B matters. So let's talk about the symmetries. The classical symmetries. These are symmetries of the equations of motion. So they do not know about the theta term. Equation of motion is easy enough. Phi double dot equals zero. And so I'm talking about symmetries that act are so-called internal symmetries. There are, we could also talk about time reflection symmetries and time translation symmetries, but let's not do that. We're just talking about internal symmetries. So what do we have? We have R of alpha, which shifts phi goes to phi plus alpha, where e to the i alpha is in U1 which is isomorphic to SO2. And then we have what you might call parity. Phi goes to minus phi, because if you think about that particle on the ring, that would be a parity transformation. Now, it's better regarding parity if we think about this H of t, our map from time into the U1 target. What's going on here is h of t goes to h of t star. So it's really charge conjugation. So I'll use c instead. All right, now these def define a group action on my field space. And so um, p r of alpha p, p squared is, is 1, clearly. And p r of alpha p is r of minus alpha. And that implies that the group we get is isomorphic to O of 2. So not surprisingly, we have the orthogonal group as a group of symmetries of our classical system. You see, classically, it doesn't matter that the particle is charged because we have what's called a flat gauge field. B is zero outside the solenoid. So it just doesn't know about that, that A in the classical world. And so the symmetries are just O of 2. Well, now let's look at the, um, at the quantum symmetries. There we go. So in, in a quantum imp implementation, well, R of alpha, well, OK, general, general point. When you have symmetries of a classical system, there are going to be corresponding operators on the Hilbert space of that system. Okay? Wigner's theorem says that there are going to be uh, unitary or anti-unitary operators for all symmetries of your classical system. However, the relations that are satisfied classically will, in general, only be 
satisfied up to phase in the quantum system. So let me, let me just make that point. So if you have a symmetry G of the classical system, then thanks to Wigner, we'll have a unitary or anti-unitary operator U of G. If G1 times G2 equals G3 classically, then in the quantum mechanics, U of G1 times U of G2 will in general only be equal to a phase times the operator that I get by, um, by uh, uh, that I assign to G1 times G2. After all, I could just change my operators by G dependent phases, right? So if I do that randomly, I'll get some phase here. But sometimes you get phases that cannot be removed by such operator redefinitions. Those are called projective representations. And what it means is that you have a representation of what's called a central extension of the classical symmetry group. That's just a completely general statement about quantum mechanics. Going back to our particular system, uh, R of alpha times psi m is e to the i m alpha psi m. And now when 2b is an integer, it makes sense to introduce another operator, psi sub m equals psi sub 2b minus m. And now another exercise for you is to calculate, c squared is clearly 1, but you calculate that this is equal to that the operators satisfy this relation. So that exemplifies what I just said about quantum mechanics. All right, now you have to start asking yourself questions like, can I remove that extra term there and the relation? And the answer is sometimes you can and sometimes you can't. And so the net result of that analysis which, by the way, is done in great detail in my group theory notes, which are referenced in my churn simons notes, uh, is that you have a trichotomy. This is the quantum impl implementation of the symmetries. So if 2b, which is theta over pi, is not an integer, then O2 is broken down quantum mechanically to SO2. End of story. If 2b, which is theta over pi, is an even integer, then in fact O2 is, remains the quant a quantum symmetry. But if 2b, which is theta over pi, is an odd integer, then O2 gets replaced by something called pin plus 2, which is a double cover, a central extension, double covering O2. Again, details are in the notes, uh, my group theory notes. Um, and also in Appendix D of a paper by Komargotsky, Gaiato, Zyberg, and Willett, which is referenced in my notes. So. Um, this last statement is kind of interesting, but actually not, not that surprising. Remember that our Hamiltonian looks like a rotor. And in this case, in case 3, L has half integer eigenvalues. So even though I have a spin 0 particle, because of that magnetic field, it actually gets half integer angular momentum. And you know that with half integer angular momentum, uh, rotation groups get lifted to spin double covers, right? And the double covering of a 2 pi rotation is plus or minus 1. Uh, so a 2 pi rotation on a spinner is actually minus 1. Well, it's like that here, too. Um, it's just that the reflections also get double covered. So it's not surprising that since the angular momentum is half integer, we should have this phenomenon. So when should I stop? Now? No? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's perfect. No. All right. Well, I didn't. Uh, let me just uh, wrap up then. Um, 
Okay, there was one more thing I wanted to do with path integrals um, in this system because there's a really beautiful point you can make about path integrals and uh, low and high temperature duality transformations. And I might or might not do that next time since we've got a lot of U1 Chern-Simons theory to do. So we'll see. Thanks. Just to repeat what Tom just said in the back, there will be coffee in the little room just right over here. So the next talk will be in a half hour and 45.